Thanks for tuning in as we talk more hockey here on ProLine TV. Jan Levine joining us from the Hockey News, rotorwire.com. How's it going, Jan? Good. How are you, Greg? Doing okay. Uh, it's time to talk Western Conference hockey. We did the Eastern Conference last week. So it's Eastern Conference, excuse me, it's Western Conference this week and then next week uh, or the week after. Uh, we'll try to come uh, to you every week, but uh, could be uh, every other week at some time, especially with the holidays coming up. Uh, we're going to get more in depth as far as specific teams, some fantasy updates specifically, go over players, uh, and even picks on some games that might be taking place depending on when we record the shows. So uh, we'll talk some Western Conference hockey, and then we're going to go over, of course, the futures in just a little bit. Uh, but, uh, you know, look, I'll start with the Central, and I haven't had time to check out the game tonight yet, but I was very interested to find out how that went between Winnipeg and Florida after what happened the other night. Wasn't that like an interesting matchup? You had this hot team, Winnipeg, just beating everybody. And then they go to Florida and they take on the defending champs and the defending champs just uh, taught them a little bit of a lesson. Uh, I will give you a little preview. That lesson has been taught back to the defending champs this evening. <laughs> so Winnipeg returned the favor with a 6-3 W tonight. So uh, look, they are, a very, we talked about this the other day. They're a very good team, right? We talked about Kyle Connor. You know, to me, one of their big keys is Nikolai Ehlers. And Ehlers has been hurt kind of year by year. If Ehlers can stay healthy, it provides a substantive amount of depth to that roster, which includes Mark Scheifele. We talked about Josh Morrissey a little bit. We know how good Connor Hellebuck is defending Vezina champion. So they are a very good team overall. Um, granted, they're playing a little bit over their heads right now, going 16-3. and three, yeah. So I don't foresee that continuing. But, um, you know, Connor, unfortunately, had the injury last year. was off to a great start before he got hurt. Mark Scheifele just seems to be a guy that constantly produces on that team. He seems to have been there forever. Ehlers is having a nice rebound season. Pionk, I'm very well aware of because he came over from the Rangers for Jacob Truba years ago, had that big year right after he went to Winnipeg, and then kind of regressed a little bit. Josh Morris, he's, uh was in the um, Norris Trophy talk, and then you look at the depth, right? Gabriel Velarde came over in the Pierre-Luc Dubois trade. Cole Perfetti was a first-rounder. Nemestikov and Nieder, Niederreiter with Lowry provide nice depth along with Appleton. So my opinion, I think the one piece of the puzzle that they're still going to do when we kind of talked a little about the other day is they're going to get some depth on the blue line. I and mean, that's the thing I think while they're playing well, right, you look at Morris, you look at Pionk, Sandberg's been okay, you look at some of the other guys. But one of those things I think that uh, that's going to happen come at the trade deadline, presuming Winnipeg doesn't suffer any material injuries and continues playing probably not at this pace, but if they continue to lead, surprisingly lead the central, which was clearly not on the radar probably when the year started, but if they continue to play of a similar nature, that's where I do think they're going to they're going to kind of take that step is getting some depth in the blue line at the deadline. Is it still though uh, hard uh, for Winnipeg? I mean, when we're talking futures and it's a long season, and you're I don't know, and again the uh, the odds are going to be. Uh, potentially a lot different now than they might be in a month or two based on how hot they are. But so there is some value that was left uh, off uh, away. Uh, if you haven't taken advantage of them early in the season before this uh, hot streak began. Uh, but um, as far as bringing players there and keeping them, is it still a problem in Winnipeg? I would say yes to a certain extent, but as they've shown, right, Mark Shifley, they were able to kind of extend. We know Connor's going to be extended. Ehlers is the one who's, a, who's a, I believe, an unrestricted free agent at year end. So they have to figure out kind of what to do with him, especially from the big guys. Marcy, I believe they've signed long term. Velarde is still relatively early in his career to a certain extent. I think he's an RFA, so they still hold his rights. So it is difficult generically for them to sign free agents and big name free agents and keep them long term just because again no disparagement but it's winnipeg right it's yeah freezing cold in the winter it's not the greatest of environments potentially but it's a supposedly phenomenal hockey environment i know a couple of people live out there who 10 games and they say it's a great arena to go to and great environs overall to be it from a hockey perspective but yes they do have that detriment in terms of locale and just reputation but if you get players at the deadline who are going to be free agents and are pure rentals and you're looking to make a run, that's probably the direction to go in. I don't know if they're going to probably acquire a lot of guys with term 
left on their deals, they'll be more more likely to look at players that maybe are pure rentals as opposed to guys where you have to kind of extend them or try to extend them. But they also could trade for players that are on longer term deals and use that as a method to kind of bolster their lineup. So if you get a guy with a year or two left on his deal, you know, A, it's going to cost you more in terms of the amount of assets you have to surrender, including either draft picks or prospects to get that player. But on the flip side, you're also getting a guy where you don't have to worry about kind of locking him up long term. It makes life a little bit easier for you. Yeah, and I would think, though, it's a tricky situation because b- because of the destination, you would think that they'd want to build – they'd really got to, got to build around their system. And then, therefore, it's a lot tougher to make trades because you don't want to be trading away assets because, again, you have to build through your system. So uh, – and we haven't right. really seen Winnipeg make a long, deep move, the, in, especially with this group. No, I think they made a run, if I remember correctly, to the Western Conference Finals. Is it three years ago? Maybe it might have been, um, okay. because Hellebuck was playing phenomenal that year. So they made a run. I think that I think it's as far as they've gotten, but they haven't been able to really get over the hump. And part of that has been so have most of those guys the uh, on the team. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think Marcy was there. There, Shifley was most certainly there. Kana was there. Ehlers was there. So a lot of okay. the, a lot of the similar names were there. But you know, part of it is. It said location. Part of it is the 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 criticism has been as Connor Hellebuck been able to do it right. He didn't wasn't good last year in the playoffs, and that's been part of the criticism of his of him to a certain extent in his career. Sooner or later, though, you would hope that he would have that breakout. But as we see, you I mean look look at the division, and we talk. Of, we're going to probably get into it. The top four, and especially several of them in those top four, is pretty stacked, right? And they're playing each other for the most part. So, yeah, getting out of that getting out of that is kind of like running the gauntlet, right? Which is what happened last year, right? Last year, you had teams beat the living tar out of each other in that first thing. And then Edmonton kind of cruised getting out of the Pacific to be able to make their run to the uh, to the Stanley Cup finals last year. Yeah, uh, because uh, Minnesota is also off to a fantastic start. And, uh, and that's why it's going to make it even tougher when you take a look at a team that has gotten off to a slow start, surprisingly, Nashville. But uh, yeah, are you surprised? Uh, are you more surprised with Minnesota or Winnipeg's hard start? Clearly, Winnipeg. I mean, Minnesota. Look, I mean, part of the question coming into the season was their goaltending, right? They Philippe Gustafson had a pretty pretty piss poor year last year. Mark Andre Fleury ended up playing a lot more than expected. He struggled. Most of us expected Jesper Wallstadt, who was their high draft pick a couple of years ago, to eventually take over as the number one netminder. But Gustafson has played great. Flurry's been very good as a supporting player, but they're also getting production from the guys who you would think, right? Kirill Kaprizov is um, cementing himself as a possible um, MVP type candidate this year or the type of season he's having. Matt Boldy has taken a step forward. Marco Rossi's been centering that first line. He's been phenomenal. Uh, you look at Matt Zuccarello, who unfortunately is hurt right now, and they're doing this without Zuccarello, who's probably at another month or so. So they're getting production from players you probably didn't expect to get. I mean, Joel Eriksson has been very, very good. And then the blue line, um, Spurgeon's come back, but the guy that's probably been clearly the number we know is Brock Faber. But they've gotten a lot of mileage out of Jacob Middleton, who they signed a couple of years ago, where they got, I think, in a trade in and they signed him. So Middleton's been very good on their back end to kind of bolster what they've gotten out of Faber. And it's been another thing where the depth has been better than expected but especially as they're doing this without Matt Zuccarello, um, you wonder as to whether or not that's going to have a material impact on them because that takes a major top six forward out of their roster. But if Gustafson and Fleury continue to play as well as they have between the pipes, they can weather the storm where offensively they may hit a little bit of a lull. But similar to, as I said, Winnipeg, right? I think a lot of teams are going to be looking for that second, especially third-line depth come playoff time. And I don't think Minnesota is any different, but they do have assets in that organization. They can most certainly move. And if Kaprizov is playing like he is now, um, he gives them that superstar that we know exists there that most teams need to kind of make that big run. So really, what was there? I mean, did they have one specific problem last year or several? Net minding was a problem. Um, Rossi didn't have a particularly good year last year. Uh, but I do think the bigger issue was a net, right? I think Gustafson okay. took a regression. Gustafson took a step back. And Flurry kind of stagged a little bit under the weight of the additional games that he played when that wasn't necessarily the expectation when the year started. So they had to rely on him a bit more. And he kind of wore down a bit as the season wore on. 
Dallas, of course, uh, made a, a little bit of a run last year. Uh, it looked like they were just for maybe a couple of days. They were the team that everyone was looking at as a potential Stanley Cup champion. And unfortunately, they weren't able to get it done, losing to Edmonton. Um, they, of course, uh, had a little bit of an opportunity to play with Tanev, and then he's gone. So uh, they, they've just gotten off to an okay start. Nothing like Minnesota or Winnipeg's. But uh, what is the difference mainly between uh, this year and uh, last year and uh, whether or not you think they have the talent this year uh, considering they weren't able to win it last year? Sure. So I think there's a couple of things. So, so first of all, um, Jason Robertson's is having an absolutely horrific year for him considering what we've expected. I mean, you're going to go down the list and go, wait, Jason Robinson has how many points? Keep going. There you go. Eight points in 17 games, clearly not what we expected, right? And then if you scroll down a bit more, you're probably going to get to Wyatt Johnston, who seven points in 17 games is also not one of those things we expected. So those two guys were being heavily counted on to produce in line with what we expected. Um, also, remember last year they had Joe Pavelski, who was making that final run and had a big season. So they're trying to make up for his absence. But they're getting better than expected production by Mason Marchment. They're getting really good production by Tyler Sagan. Logan Stankoven, who's actually a rookie this year based upon the number of games he played last year. He's having a fine season. Matt Duchesne, we know, came over from Nashville a couple of years ago. Turned back the clock, and he's having another rebound type of season this year. Rupe Hints, we all know how good he is. And the bigger issue, as I said, is the two guys where you would expect to get production, and also Miro Hiskinen has actually had a pretty poor start. But Jake Ottinger has kind of made up for it in terms of what he's done in, in between the pipes. And he had a brutal playoff series um, last year, right? Um, that's that's the, the issue that happened with Dallas last year. They made it to, they made that run and all of a sudden he just kind of collapsed in the playoffs, which was huge. This year he's having another fine regular season. So, but the jury's going to be out is can he do it again in the postseason? But the thing that's beneficial for them is they are 11 and six and they're Big, big players, yeah. Robertson and Johnston, who you're kind of expecting to produce or not. Now, granted, that's likely going to be offset by a couple of guys like March Mint and others returning back to earth. But if that happens and the big boys kind of take their step forward, you would expect Dallas with the talent that they have is kind of be right there, especially if Heiskanen kind of plays up to what we expect. That's all. All right. Well, uh, it still me. It still seems to me though that I mean, well, first of all, well, well, do they have? enough to go out and get another key guy at the deadline yeah i mean there's talent in the organization maybe not the same kind of talent look the point being is their big talent is probably up there already right you look at guys like John stan coven is one of those guys right but the guy who maverick bork who came up last year who played well in the playoffs if they really wanted to um sweeten the pot for lack of a better term to go out and get somebody that they need Bork is one of those guys that can most certainly use his trade okay. bait and would garner a certain a lot of interest at the deadline. Colorado, it's been a couple of years, and they still uh, have a loaded uh, unit, but how is the health? That's the main thing. I think the health, for the most part, has been okay. I mean, I think the problem is, as we've discussed, right, is Alexander Georgiev. He's been a sieve in net. It's why I said before the year I start that Eustace Anunin, who's playing now, will likely be wow. the number one. But you look at that 886 8 percent on Anunin, and you look at the 863 on Georgiev, and both of them are clearly not up to speed. But what's been beneficial is you look at what's taking place. Cal McCarr is having another Norris Trophy type of season. We all know how good Nathan McKinnon is. You know I love Miko Ranton and is one of my favorite players in the NHL. And Casey Middlestadt has been great, but they've also just gotten back Arturi, um, Arturi Lekkinen's back from an injury. Um, Valerie Nakushkin is back from his suspension, and there's still some potential that Gabriel Landeskog could maybe make it back by the end of the year, though I'm not counting on it. But the problem is, is once you get past that top depth that's yeah. there, then that, that other guys, right? Ross Colton being out is a major loss. He'll be back, but he's out another month or so with his injury. He broke his foot, I believe. They had Nikolai Kovalenko down and up and down and up, and he's been okay. But Colton is one of those guys, if he could come back and bolster that top six, that's a big addition for them, almost like another acquisition. But 
look, they have tremendous depth up front. The bigger question is who in God's name is going to be their goalie. And it certainly, to me, doesn't look like Georgiev is the guy who's going to be their guy to lead them. But that's probably their major weakness right now is between the pipes. All right. And then uh, if there's a team to make a run at the top four, is it Nashville? Yeah, I'd have, you'd have to probably say Nashville. I mean, look, there is a lot of talent on that team, right? But you and I have kind of discussed this when it comes to football also, right? It's the how does the talent mesh? Right? How, how do the players come together? And right now, it is a collection of individuals as opposed to a team is probably the best way to refer to it. Sam Coast has gotten off to a rough start being there. Jonathan Marsh or so has gotten off to a little bit of a rough start. Um, between the pipes, you see Saros hasn't been particularly great in terms of his numbers. He's been a little up and down good, but not great. So there's just way too much talent that exists there that you would think they were going to be this bad for this long. But as you see, we've also talked about, right, you, you know, last year we've seen St. Louis make a major run a couple of years ago. We saw a couple teams last year make a run, but you know the further you fall behind, with there being three point efforts in games, it makes it harder to make that run. But the other guy, Brady Shea, was brilliant in Car- Carolina. And you have to start wondering maybe was he a product of the system in Carolina as opposed to him taking that step forward, which certainly looks like the case. But you'd kind of have to say of the bottom four, is there anyone that could get themselves into playoffs? Remember. Top eight teams make it, top three from each conference, and then there's two wild cards. You can have five teams from a division. You know, Nashville gets into that fifth spot, and they're right on the outskirts, you know, of it. If they get to that spot and they're hot, and Saros can become a hot goalie, and look, we're projecting four or five months down the road where we are, right? But that's a team that you would expect to move their way up the ladder a little bit and put themselves into – better save, better position in terms of being in a playoff hunt as opposed to chasing, right? And that all depends, obviously, what we see that comes out of the Pacific as well. All right. We'll talk more about the Utah Hockey Club uh, on another show. So uh, that's the Central. Now let's move on uh, to the Pacific. And uh, Vegas, of course, is just it seems like they're always going to be up top. Uh, of course, you got the uh, the Kings, the Oilers, and Vancouver, the, which, which at this point still looks like maybe that's going to be the four, uh, just like last year. Uh, Calgary seems to be playing a little bit better than people uh, thought. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll start at the top with Vegas. Uh, what's the uh, what's how's the makeup of this team compared to the championship team a few years ago? Well, it's Vegas, right? So they did lose Jonathan Marsha, so we talked about right. They've had some other defections for lack of a better term, but you look at the talent that's up front, right? You know, Mark Stone's out injured, but they made the trade for Tomas Hurtle last year and he came back from his injury. Jack Eichel is probably having, he's on pace for the best season he's probably ever had. You look at William Carlson, who just seems to always be there. Ivan Barbashev, who came over a couple of years from St. Louis has been phenomenal on the top line. Nicholas Ra is the kind of guy you can move up and down the line if you put him on the first line, second line, third line. Irrespective of where you put him, he always seems to produce. And right now he's in a top six role, and he's producing in that top six role. Um, and then you look at Brett Howden, who came over from the Rangers, who was a bust there, who scored seven goals. Pavel Dorofiev has been really good. So they are a very, very deep lineup. And Alexander Holtz is the guy they got. I mean, granted, Paul Cotter. And the guys they gave up to New Jersey are playing great. Holtz seems to have solidified himself as a, in a top nine role. But what sets them apart is their defense. You look at Pietrangelo, Hannafin, Theodore, and McNabb, who they just signed to another three-year deal, who's the last of the original misfits, I think, or one of them. That's a pretty damn good top four. They're big. They're physical. They can score, right? And then you look between the pipes, and we know that they, they, they traded Logan Thompson this year. But Aiden Hill obviously has a cup to his resume, and they brought in Ilya Samsonov, who was decent and really good with Washington two years ago, not good last year. But that's a very deep team. It is a playoff-tested team. It is a deep team. It's one of those teams that you would expect to have a very realistic shot to come out of the Western Conference and make a playoff and be a Stanley Cup finalist again. But why are they better on paper than, say, last year? Hurdle, healthy. Nicholas Waz playing great. 
They brought in Holtz that gives them depth. They're using Dorofiev in a, in a full role right now. And Eichel, honestly, has really taken a step forward this year. He was good last year, but he's really taken his game to a whole nother level right now and okay. kind of playing similar to what you saw two years ago in the playoffs also. Uh, the Kings, uh, they still just play that uh, style that I just uh, prefer not to watch. Um, but it's successful, and uh, it is what it is. But uh, talk about whether or not uh, they they can do more in the postseason. Even though the matchup last year against Edmonton in the first round was just – they were never going to get past that. So maybe a better matchup if they get to the postseason could help them out. But do they have what it takes to be a, a winning postseason team? Um, it's a good question. I don't know right now. The problem is, I think, also goaltending. Darcy Kemper has been good, but unfortunately he's hurt again. David Riddich has actually stepped in fairly nicely and played well. But I don't know whether or not either one of them I would view as a true playoff-type goalie. I mean, Kemper had Kemper obviously has a cup. So granted, he played with Colorado before he went to – um Washington and then they traded him in the in the Pierre Luc Dubois deal. So pedigree, yes, he hasn't had the best year, but you know he is a kind of goalie you can plug in and say, look, he's playoff tested. He won a cup. So it's kind of hard to argue. They are they are a good, not great team. I mean you look at what they have up front. Look every year we talk about Anzai Kopitar and every year we expect him to maybe take a step backwards and every <laughs> year he just he just keeps producing, right? Adrian Kempe yeah. is one of those guys that none of people talk about. And I think he got 40 goals last year. The guy who's really taken a step forward is Alex Laferrere. He's having a very big year. They've moved him up and down the lineup and expecting him to take a step forward. They're also making do without Drew Dowdy right now, who's hurt. So if he comes back and he's fully healthy, especially what we've seen out of Brand Clark and also Vladislav Gavrikov, who they got from Columbus a couple of years ago. If Dowdy comes back, that really makes their defense a heck of a lot better, right? So you put him as your even a second pair guy, where he's normally a first pair guy. You move somebody else to the second pair. Kings are going to be a tough out if Kemper is healthy and can produce offensively. They have enough up front, and their blue line should be good enough that they should be able to remain somewhere within the top four of the division. Edmonton, the defending uh, Western champs, uh, came a game away from. Uh, championship and a dramatic uh, Stanley Cup finals, but they weren't able to get it done. They're off to another slow start, just like last year. Uh, a little bit better, actually, than last year. But still, there's a lot expected from this team. Are they just basically sleepwalking at this point, waiting for the postseason? You could, you could say it's a little bit of hangover, right? And that's a little dangerous of a game to play. I mean, you've had a lot of guys who have gotten off to relatively slow starts. Look, Evan Bouchard has finally found his game. He had seven points in 17 games. He's got six points in his last three games. Um, you look at Darnell Nurse, who's now probably going to miss a couple of weeks after the vicious hit by Ryan Reeves. That really hurts their blue line. Ryan Nugent Hopkins is not having a particularly good year. Connor McDavid got his thousandth point the other night, and then I think he got three points yesterday. So he's on pace again for – another thousand um, you look at, you know, the kind of the rest of the lineup and part of the question associated with them is going to be goaltending. I mean, that that's kind of always the key for them. Stuart Skinner is a guy who took a step forward last year. Um, you know, I think he made a surprising run is the best way to refer to it. I mean, and they're also making do. I mean, Zach Hyman last year had 54 goals and he's got three goals in 20 games. I mean, that's just, wow. we expected some kind of regression, <laughs> yeah. but there's a difference between some kind of regression and falling off a cliff. And he just finally started to get a little bit hot. So you would expect, look, any team that's got McDavid and has yeah. dry sidle is going to make a run, right? The only question is, is what's going on last year? Chris Knobloch was hailed as the savior when he came over and took over as the coach. And this year they were ready to get rid of him a month into the season. So <laughs> those how fickle fans can be. But Edmonton is also one of those teams barring a complete, kind of collapse there's too much talent up front for them not to be in the top four in the division and look they they almost want to stand like cup with Stuart skinner which uh it just shows you how like you were saying how great their star power is their their forwards uh but i mean that guy is far from or should be far from a stanley cup championship goalie uh 
did they maybe um, look at, because look, he got replaced. And uh, if Vancouver maybe had uh, finished them off, uh, then I'm not even sure he'd be the starting goalie this year. I mean, look, Skinner, they don't really have a lot of other options right now. So it's either going to be Skinner or Bust. And it's something we've talked about for years with them is they've, they've cycled through tons of goalies, right? They had a couple of goalies that basically um, they tried out and they kept referring as Mike Smith year after year after year, if you remember, and they kept hoping he would be the guy and he had some runs, but Skinner is a decent goalie. He's an okay goalie. He's not a great goalie, but their viewpoint they have is he's good enough. And that's kind of where they're at right now. All right. And then uh, Vancouver, my team, uh, it's uh, they made a, a huge uh, jump last year, uh, thanks to Rick Tockett. And uh, now all of a sudden they're dealing with a lot of adversity. Uh, JT Miller is just taking the leave of absence. We have no idea exactly how long that's going to last. Brock, of course, is still out with his concussion uh, uh, symptoms, whatever you want to call it. Demko should be back soon. Uh, we have no idea when. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's, they're dealing with issues, but even, even though they are, they're just so well coached, uh, that, um, I think they've also been very fortunate with the schedule. Very fortunate. They just had their first back to back. They haven't had a lot of, uh, issues, uh, schedule wise, which is something that they're going to have to deal with soon enough. But, um, yeah. What do you think? What's your perspective on the team? So a couple of things. So, I mean, I think they probably exceeded expectations a lot last year. Um, as you mentioned, though, there's been a ton of injuries. I mean, we'll start with Thatcher Demko, who's been out. And, you know, they were very lucky that Kevin Lankin and hadn't signed with anybody and he was waiting yeah. to get a deal. And they were able to get him very late and he stood up very well, but he's also sagging a little bit um, into um, basically prior form. And Arthur Silovs is now getting a shot and he's starting tonight against the Rangers. And, He's going to get, I wouldn't say a lot of games, but they're going to probably play him a little bit to try to reduce the load because Lankin is not used to playing this many games yep. historically. But they're also now making do with injuries, right? Brock Besser has been out. JT Miller, unfortunately, is now out. Um, you're not getting a ton of support. I mean, Hughes has obviously been their best player. Pedersen got off to an absolutely hellaciously poor start. He's finally rounding into form. DeBrusque was signed to kind of be that secondary or tertiary option he got off to a little bit of a slow start he's found his form a little bit so there's just as you said a lot of parts in there that aren't necessarily meshing or are out and they're trying to kind of make do with spit and bailing wire um until they can kind of get some of their other bodies back but you know one of the guys we talked about in the chat was uh, jonathan lakaramaki their number one prospect got a goal his first game uh they're going to Give him the opportunity to play. Right now, originally he was called up to replace Besser. If Besser returns in a short while, he'll probably stick because JT Miller's out. But Miller is truly the heart and soul of that team. At least he's become yeah. the heart and soul of that team. So be interesting to kind of see. I mean, it's as we kind of tape this, it's uh three three, unfortunately. Vancouver tied the game again, which I'm sure as you know pleases me as a Ranger fan, but makes you happy. But look, there's 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 Talent up there, as you mentioned, Tockett's a very, very good coach. Um, he's going to have them prepared every game. And the question is, is A, whether or not there's enough on the blue line. Um, I mean, Hughes is great. Myers is fine. Beyond that, there's probably questions. Um, and if their front end is lacking and they don't get Demko back to be their true number one, it's going to be whether or not Seelov says he did last year in the playoffs, coupled with Lankinen can kind of keep them alive until some of their some of their wounded warriors make their way back. And as far as the rest of the uh, the, the other would would Calgary be the only team or would it be Seattle that you could uh, see make a run? I mean I think Seattle has talent. Um, look, the problem is Matty Beniers ever since his Calder trophy season has regressed substantially. He's been kind of brutal. Um, Joey Decord has been there and become their number one goaltender, but I'm not sure if Decord or, you know, um, Mackenzie Blackwood is really a, sorry, um, but, but I don't know if Decord is really, and Grubauer, sorry, I'm thinking um, San Jose, I don't know if, I don't know if Decord or Grubauer are true number ones, I think Decord has really become their number one, 
He's basically got a five-year deal they signed last year based upon the run that they made. Uh, they were very good a couple of years ago. Obviously, their second year, uh, they made the playoffs. They've regressed a little bit since then. Calgary's got talent up front. I mean, first of all, you have your two number one in net. Dustin Wolf is probably going to be their number one and really should be their number one in net right now. And then you look at kind of their offense. Um, there's, you know, Jonathan Huberdeau has had some resurgence a little bit. Nazem Kadri, you know Andre Kuzmenko very well. He started off very well and kind of has regressed. They lost Anthony Mantha for the season. That's a not a big loss, but that removes a guy they can maybe trade. So the problem is, is if Kuzmenko and, and Sharon Golvov don't necessarily kind of play like they did last year after coming there, I don't know whether or not they have the depth up front to kind of make a run. So if Seattle can find a way to ignite Matty Berniers and get him jolted and Joey Decord, maybe it's that way. But the likelihood, as we talked about, it, if Nashville makes that run, whoever's the four seed in the West and the four or five seed in the Central, Pacific and West, they're going to fight for that eighth playoff spot, right? And I don't know if anybody below that has got a real opportunity to kind of make enough of a run to make it interesting between them. Taking a look at the futures in the West uh, and just taking a look at that first, those first four uh, as far as the favorites. And again, these are the West odds. So just double them for the Stanley Cup odds. Uh, are you surprised that Dallas is the second choice here? Um, I would say mildly, but I think part of it is like we talked about, everybody's kind of expecting Jason Robertson and Wyatt Johnston to kind of make, to kind of rebound which would be surprised that they don't. And then if you do that, you have a true goalie like Ottinger, similar to, to Hellebuck. I think the viewpoint is, is Dallas is a deeper lineup potentially. And I use the term potentially because what we've seen out of Winnipeg, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't think Winnipeg is it. So based upon yeah. those odds, I got to be honest with you, I'm taking Winnipeg every which way but two. Now, granted, I will wholeheartedly admit the argument of that they are peaking too early certainly yeah. has to be taken into account. I mean, you go 16 and three, you're likely going to have a little bit of a rough spot eventually. And even if you don't, the viewpoint's got to be is have you kind of like shot your load a bit too early and peaked a bit too early and you're going to eventually kind of hit a rough part. But I think a lot of that's going to depend on who ends up the eight seed. So let's say, let's say Winnipeg is your number one. If Nashville is your number eight seed, I got to be honest with you, there's no way on God's green earth. I want to face Nashville in a playoff series. They play a little bit of a heavy game. They're a physical team. And they also, if 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 they've made that run, that means they've kind of found their form. That means Stamkos is kind of clicking. That means Saros is between the pipes. That means Roman Josie is kind of hot. So if all that happens, that's clearly not a team you're going to want to face playoff time. So it, it's, to me, it looks like Las Vegas is a, it, probably the best bargain early this early in the season. Because, again, speaking early, of yeah. Winnipeg, there's no way you can wager on Winnipeg right now. You just can't do it because they just can't get any better. And where their odds are right now, like you said, they will regress at some point, even just a little bit. So the odds can't get lower than this. It just can't. So if I'm, if you believe in Winnipeg and if you haven't already put money on them, just relax. Just wait, wait it out, and you're probably going to get a little bit of better number. You never know. You could have injuries. So I think you've lost the boat at this point of the year on Winnipeg. So just wait. For Vegas, though, I, I think they're the best bargain here. Yeah, I would agree. 900 is a really good bargain. I mean, again, if you really want to take a flyer, you know, take a flyer on Nashville, right? If you're really, if you're really yeah. a, uh, a gambling man, right, go go for Nashville at 1400 because honestly, if your viewpoint is, is they're going to make a run eventually, then sure, make a run. Go go take Go take a flyer. Yeah, again, just taking a look at the uh, the championship. In Vegas, there. 1,800. I mean, 18 yeah. to 1 is a pretty darn good odds to get. Yeah. And staying with Nashville, if you want to, you know, throw a couple of uh, dollars on 30. them as a, as a flyer at 30 to 1, why not? And would there be anybody else uh, that you would long shot wise in the West that you nah, would uh, keep an eye probably, on? Not, probably not. not. I mean, look, granted, teams have made runs in the past. Uh, I, I don't know if there's any other one you can kind of, you know, say – if not, I think you're kind of wasting your money to kind yeah. of throw it. Maybe it's feasible, but those are the, that's the teams I think you're going to make a run. I mean, maybe I would say maybe Minnesota. I mean, look, if for some reason you have to go with Flurry, right? You know he's won a cup already. I just think you're 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 placing your bet on an older goalie to make yeah. a long playoff run. Maybe difficult though. If Gustafson starts playing as he has, maybe maybe that's the maybe that's the one that uh, that leads him forward because. 
He was brilliant two years ago when they got him from Ottawa. Flurry. How old is he? 40, I think, or close to Jeez. it. Jeez. a second. Hold on. Wow. I mean, look, he's got look at look at look at his numbers. He's got 500 wins already. So 500 plus wins. He's, he's got a brilliant career. He's brilliant career. He's 39. 39. He just turned 30. He, he'll he'll be 40 November 28th. So he's almost 40. Wow, that's just nuts. And he's anyway. got 560 wins in his career. He'll cruise into the Hall of Fame when he hangs them up. <laughs> All right, Jan, I appreciate it. I know how busy you are, and I look forward to talking to you again uh, within the next couple of weeks when we talk again. Uh, we'll take a more broader look around the league. We'll pick a couple of teams uh, every uh, every time we uh, talk to maybe zero in on and uh, definitely get more of a fantasy slant to as well as maybe even talk a little bit. Again, we'll keep up to date on the futures always. Uh, but maybe even we'll pick a game or two that might be on the schedule whenever we do our videos. So, Jen, appreciate it. And, again, we'll have a link in the description for uh, all three of your outlets. Uh, anything particular you're working on, Hockey News or uh, Rotowire? So, Rotowire, my barometer, which is my risers and fallers column, went up today. Um, always goes up every Tuesday. Um, and the cheat sheets are constantly updated. Um Hockey News, I'm um, responsible to do kind of, it's a DFS look daily. So myself and Jason Chen, who does it, we kind of write daily. There's a couple of articles also out there as broader articles, but usually it's kind of a couple of guys to target. And we use a 50% roster threshold as kind of our demarcation point. So focusing on um, skaters, both forwards and defensemen, as well as goalies are kind of our focus. And then um hockey buzz will be another recap tonight hopefully a happy recap for me and not so much of a happy recap for you after the ranger game tonight i'll take a point trust me the way the, the way three, my team's three, been looking it's three, it's three three it's three three after two right now so we'll see where yeah. we land uh tonight they've had uh they've had bad really bad periods in this stretch so three three could turn into seven three uh when i wake up uh Works appreciate it coach uh, and uh, maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll be a lot more healthier. We can have a much more uh, uh, intense battle uh, next time we play. And I'm not sure when Vancouver's coming to New York, but March, uh, March. Oh, good March. March. We got a ways to yes. go then for that yes, one. Yes, we do. Uh, all right, Jan. Thanks. We'll talk to you again soon. Sounds good.